I'm going to talk about sarcoflex and uh, especially the trifocal sarcoflex. But first, I want to discuss uh, material and design and some kind of the history of this lens, which is more than 10 years old. The first lens was implanted in 2007. It is very important as we implant this lens into the sulcus to direct contact to uveal tissue that we have a material with high uveal biocompatibility. And in the 90s we could show that uh, hydrophilic material is superior to hydrophobic material uh, concerning the biocompatibility, especially the uveal one. We have significantly less foreign body giant cells to be seen on the surface of hydrophilic lenses as compared to hydrophobic lenses. And this was published in the 90s in several publications. Right now we have three different additive IOLs on the market. The crystal lens from Reverso, the Reina Salcoflex, which was the first add-on lens, and the first Q lens. As I mentioned, in 2004, I had the idea of implanting or designing a lens especially for the sulcus in order to correct ametropia. And in 2007, I implanted the first sulcoflex. This at that time was a monofocal lens which was implanted on a patient who was highly myopic and had a biometrical surprise. So in order to correct that, we did a secondary implantation first and uh, with a very nice result. And that started uh, the implantation of uh, this lens. In 2018, I implanted the first trifocal lens, but I will discuss and talk about that later. And we also implanted toric versions of this lens in the former years. There were also at that time, in the beginning of 2000, uh, uh, cadaverized studies by Liliana Werner and with the Miyake viewing, she could show that these add-on lenses have a good centration and minimal contact to uveal tissue, to the sulcus and to the iris, because it's important that we have an iris clearance and no contact to the iris. There also were clinical studies performed. They could show at that time, it was published in 2010, I think, uh, that uh, the optical uh, performance of two lenses within the eye is very similar to the performance of a single lens in the eye. One could think that there are more surfaces and because of that there are more reflections and more loss of light th coming through the eye. Uh, but at that time they could show that it's only an additional light loss of about 1%. And this was established later much more precisely, and I will tell you that and show you that later on. We, as I mentioned, implanted the first Rayner lens 14 years ago, and at that time we performed a study with 200 eyes, and we at that time found this was mainly monofocal lenses or toric versions of the Salcoflex lens, and we could show that there is almost that there was no contact to the iris, a good uh, iris lens distance. You can see this here on the UVM here. And there also was a, in the center a good distance between the two lenses. So there was no optical contact in the center because optical contact leads to flattening of the surface and changes the refraction. You, you, you create a hypopic defocus if you have a contact in the center. And this was with standard lenses, if you have put two bag lenses in the eye, you, you have this contact. So it is important that you have a concave posterior surface of these additive lenses. So there was a nice distance between the posterior surface of the sarcoflex and the anterior surface of the bag lens. We also performed a centration study and we could show within the same eye, that's the interesting part, and Dr. Praga, who wrote this study, is here, available. Uh, uh, we could show that the, the center 
the centration of the back lens is inferior to the centration of the sulcus lens. And we estimate and we think we are performing this study right now that in the future this should stay because sulcoflex lens or any additive lens stays in the sulcus. There is no contraction, there is no change of, of the position of the lens as compared to the capsular back implant uh, uh, part um, where you have capsular contraction and where you might have a dynamic change of the centration and at the time when we did these um, examinations we could show that there was significantly better centration in the sulcus lens as compared to the back lens in the same eye. There are also some specific indications for additive lenses. If you have a dynamic refraction, if you have a change of the refraction, mainly because of a pediatric cataract or in silicone oil cases or sometimes in corneal or scleral uh, alterations, you have a change of the refraction and in that cases you may um, uh, accommodate the refraction to the situation of the patient. And here, this was my first case, a two-year-old boy, and I did an, an implantation of a, a cataract surgery with anterior vitrectomy and implanted a sulcoflex lens. Uh, additionally, in the eye, I call that duet implantation, so I do both lenses in the same procedure. And I aimed for emetropia, that worked nicely. And as there was a myopic shift because of the growth of the eye, three years later we had to exchange that lens because the, the eye became myopic. And at that time I didn't just explant the, the add-on lens, which was quite easy. Uh, you could show that, you could see that on the, on the video below. This is the video of the ex exchange and the upper video was the first surgery three years ago. Uh, and then we explanted the lens and implanted an additive lens again in order to keep the patient in a emetropic status. And I think this might change the pediatric cataract surgery significantly in the future because you may really titrate the refraction and not only hope that the patient will stay not, will become not too myopic later on. So the conclusion after 14 years of follow-up with our different cases is that supplementary IOLs are effective for secondary enhancement. So you may implant a multifocal lens on top of an old bag lens or for primary duet implantation for combination of cataract surgery or clear lens extraction, implanting the lens in the bag and putting an additive lens on top. And they represent, and that's also very important, a reversible or exchangeable technology for the future. So the next step was to create a diffractive trifocal optic. And this optic was already established for the Ray-1 trifocal lens. This is a trifocal diffractive lens for the in the back implantation. And the same optic was used for this additive sulcoflex trifocal lens. So the optic performance is very similar to the back lens. The difference is you put this optic on top of a monofocal lens. The surgery is straightforward. In secondary IOL implantation, if you want to correct an ametropic surprise or if you want to give some multifocality to the patient, you easily may use the spherical equivalent and you multiply it by 1.5 if the patient is hyperopic postoperatively or you multiply it by 1.2 if the patient is myopic. If, as long as this is in a range of plus minus seven diopters, if the range is higher, which is rarely the case, uh, then you may use uh, the r virgins formula or some ray trace formula which is provided by the company. So this is straightforward to calculate. You can do that with your brain, hopefully. Uh, in duet procedure, we use a modern biometrical formula 
in order to calculate the back monofocal implant. And we put a zero and the additive part of the lens on top. So we just go for close to zero and implant the add-on lens on top. Here this is a, a procedure 2.5 millimeter, 2.4 millimeter now we at that time this is a little bit older video because this was the first implantation of a, tri, of a trifocal lens. Here it is important that you implant the bag lens and then you remove the viscoelastic from the bag so that you have a clean capsular bag. Then you again put some viscoelastic on top of the lens and on top of the anterior capsule and you lift the iris so that you have some space behind the iris in order to safely implant the lens into the sulcus. Here this is a medicell injector. This is quite a nice instrument for implanting this lens. They are not preloaded, at least right now. They are not available in a preloaded pre -loaded status. And then you just advance the, the, plan, um, the, the plunger. Here you will see that the leading haptic comes out very slowly and controlled. It's a very soft material and a very soft haptic and you position uh, the leading haptic behind the iris. Then the optic unfolds. And then you may use a spatula in order to push the trailing haptic behind the iris. Then I, re I, I try to have the bag lens and the sulcus lens, the haptics 90 degrees to each other. And then I go behind the sarcoflex lens and remove the viscoelastic from the interface. I think this is very important because otherwise you have an entrapping of the viscoelastic and you might have a pressure spike. And then I remove the rest of the viscoelastic. And here at the end you see the well-centered add-on lens on top of the bag lens. Results for dual implantation. We compared ray one trifocal to additive sulcoflex trifocal, very similar defocus curve as to expect because it's almost the same optic. Uh, the outcomes were also published. And here you see the defocus curve one month and six months, very stable. There was no change within time. And this is a very nice presentation from the Heidelberg group of Gerd Aufert and Dr. Koramnia has published that several, for for several times now, and he could show uh, that there is the, almost the same optical quality as compared to a bag lens, a single bag lens. In comparison to an Acrisoft lens, for instance, with a very high refractive index, uh, he could show that even a duet implantation has less light loss as compared to a single hydrophobic acrylic lens. These are the data from Heidelberg. So the optical performance is similar to a single lens situation. So I think this is a very important argument when you think about using a duet or an additive lens for multifocal correction. Secondary enhancement is another option. So you may enhance the monofocal situation of a patient. This is somewhat different because if you have a patient with a perfect vision and without any cataract and no halos, because with a monofocal lens you don't expect that you have halos, some glare maybe, but at least no halos and very low glare. When you implant on that good vision eye an additive lens, you have to tell the patient, unless he gets disappointed, that he will have halos and that he might have some kind of more glare as compared to the monofocal status. So this is kind of different, but if the patient ha has the, the wish really to get independent from glasses, it is a way to go. And the good thing is, and this any patient will understand, you can step backwards because you may explant that lens in other situations. Here this is a, is a single case. I don't go into the detail now. 
uh, where there was a situation where the patient had on one side a multifocal lens already and on the other side he had a heterochromia and because of that uh, the surgeon didn't implant a multifocal lens which was not a good, very good idea because then he had a monofocal lens and a multifocal lens on the other side and in that case I thought it is a good idea to implant even if it was an heterochromia I, uh, an add-on lens and we had a very nice result on both sides you see some after cataract on the top picture because I first implanted the sulcus lens and we planned to do the yak capsulotomy afterwards. But if you have a situation where there is a yak capsulotomy done already, there's also no problem to, to, to do the implantation without any vitreous loss or something. So there's no, no really uh, uh, situation where you can't use this lens for correcting the situation. Here you see this secondary implantation. There's some after cataract. You see these Elschnick pearls, these flat pearls on the uh, lower side at five o'clock about. And it's the same implantation again. Uh, here it is even easier because uh, the capsular bag is fibrotic already and you don't run the risk to implant the leading haptic into the bag. This sometimes happens if you don't take care that you really bring the haptic behind the iris and not into the capsular bag. Sometimes it might try to go behind and then you just take a cap, uh, some spatula and, and push it up. But nevertheless, you have to take care that you don't implant some of the parts of the sarcoflex into the bag. Yeah, this is the, the implantation. Again, the, the evacuation of viscoelastic at the end is important. There also was an AU trial, a multi-center study from seven sites and at that time they could show that um, for secondary implantation and they did a pre-op measurement of the monofocal lens and a post-op measurement after the additive lens implantation and in uh, photopic uh, conditions there was no significant difference of contrast. Uh, in mesopic there was some slight, with higher frequencies there was some decrease as to expect of the uh, contrast sensitivity as compared, compared to the pre-op status where the patient was monofocal. Uh, these are the uh, troublesome uh, the f uh, phenomena with uh, light scattering uh, and these were almost, these were in an acceptable number as to see here and there was no highly troublesome situation in that patient group. So in conclusion, all patients were satisfied with their distance, intermediate and near vision. No surgical and post-op complications had to be were seen. And there was no difference to the results of a trifocal in the bag lens. But, and that's the important thing, and in my opinion, the take-home message, supplementary IOLs of an adaptive and reversible option. And I think this makes very much sense in situations where you have maybe some slight dry macular degeneration, where you have a patient who has no diabetic retinal disease, but is a diabetic patient, and he really wants to have, have that situation. And even if you put the multifocal lens into a healthy eye, you never know what happens 20, 30 years later, where some of these patients definitely will develop some AMD or so, and they will need more contrast. And in those situations, and I have a few of those patients, we may explant that lens and come to a monofocal situation. We may increase the um, contrast and hopefully help the patient in that cumbersome situation where there is a decrease of retinal function. So I want to show you this reversibility. There you see the explantation of a lens. It is a 2.5 millimeter incision. In that case, I just bring out one of the haptics and then I just grasp the optic edge and just pull the lens out. It's very thin and soft and it folds along the corneal incision. And I can say that this is, in my opinion, a reversible situation, yeah. That's the main and important thing with that system, I think. You have also the option of fine-tuning. You have 
water steps of this lens. So you really can exactly uh, titrate the refraction. Reversibility I've mentioned and early explantation we have the chance to explant that lens if there is no neural adaptation after a few months. And later on we have the option of late explantation because this lens is not in ingrown, this lens is not held by capsular contraction forces or, or whatsoever and you can explant that lens at, lens at any time. So optical quality is almost identical to single multifocal bag lenses. And in my opinion, the main indications is multifocal duet implantation and in pseudophagic patients, the multifocal enhancement, but take care with the uh, promising situation of this uh, kind of patients and definitely the biometrical surprise. I think this to, to be able to correct any biometrical surprise at any time, you don't have to wait for instance, for laser, you would have to wait until you do the, the suction and so on. You can straight, after a few days, you may implant and correct a situation where the patient is unhappy because of an ametropic surprise. Yes, these are the main indications, I think. Yeah, so I thank you for, your, for being here. And uh, if you have any questions, I think we should discuss it right now.